Glenn and Jackie, thank you so much for joining us. Your coverage of the last 72 hours has been nothing short of extraordinary. Glenn, let me start with you. And some of the Times reporting, isn't this always the case for Trump? I mean, he was trying to run the country while all of his senior advisors were going in and out of the Mueller um, teams, investigative um, offices and, and headquarters. Now he's trying to run for president a third time. And most of the people that surround him are either co-defendants or witnesses against him. Well, what was really interesting is the, the, at the arraignment, I was in the courtroom uh, in Miami on Tuesday. And uh, the one thing that both the defense and prosecution could agree on is they did not want, as a precondition of his uh, bond, of his being released from the court, uh, to have any restrictions on who he could really communicate with. It was this sort of fill-in judge, Judge Jonathan Goodman, who really got kind of irked at the lack of restrictions on Trump, particularly given these accusations of, of witness, potential witness tampering, and insisted really over the objection of Jack Smith's, uh, one of Jack Smith's top, lieutenant, top lieutenants, uh, to impose restrictions on any of the witnesses, including Walt Nauta, to discuss the case with Trump unless it was through counsel. It was really extraordinary because Jack Smith and his team uh, knowing full well that Donald Trump is not one known for <laughs> respecting boundaries, really understood how dangerous this could be. They want to prosecute Trump for what has happened. They don't necessarily want to have this complicated by having uh, revisiting the conditions of Donald Trump being released from custody. It's such an interesting conundrum for a normal person. We know from covering Trump for seven years that he isn't normal and that he's totally... Um, He's not, nothing gives him pause. I mean, what we call witness tampering, he calls um, just doing business. I mean, how do his lawyers bake in sort of how he rolls with the defense they're going to try to mount, Glenn? Well, I think a, 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 a sort of a threshold question, who are those lawyers going to be? You know, again, one of the most consequential moments of that arraignment was when Christopher Kyes and Todd Blanche, the two people who were representing him in court said that they intended to be permanent counsel. That kind of came as news to all of us, because in the prior 48 hours, we've been hearing all these rumors about Trump appealing to other Florida-based lawyers who might be his counsel. And I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that there will be new lawyers introduced. But yeah, this is an incredibly difficult, uh, an incredibly difficult job for, for any attorney representing him. And it's really compounded by the fact that uh, Boris, uh, Boris Epstein, um, uh, who is sort of playing this shadowy role as both Trump's legal counsel, political consigliere, and public relations person, uh, is someone who seems to be con having significant conflicts with uh, the previous legal team. I mean, uh, James Trustee quit, uh, Rowley quit. No one seems to be able to sort of get along with, with Boris. So I think a, a, another fundamental question is, uh, whoever is brought into this, and we are talking about serious potential jail time, are they still going to have to deal with the complicating factor of Boris Epstein talking to the, bo the boss and sort of undercutting them at every step of the way? And it's interesting, Jackie. I mean, Boris has the role that Rudy played um, sort of around the Mueller probes and the impeachment um, trials. Uh, you have some amazing reporting, though, on this dynamic. I mean, Chris Kais has already been dissed in terms of the legal counsel he provided, counsel that, based on your fantastic new reporting, may have avoided an indictment altogether in favor of one of Trump's known um, pen pals and advisors, Tom Fitton, who gave him advice on January 6th that should he be charged there may also have a tie to putting criminal exposure for Donald Trump into motion. Yeah, Nicole, and I just have to give my colleague Josh Dossi a, a major shout out. He took the lead on this piece and somehow managed to byline three different pieces yesterday on, on this Mar-a-Lago documents case alone. But it, it is, uh, there is a consistent thread here, which is when Trump listens to advice from the non-lawyers and the political animals in the room, people like Tom Fitton and Boris Epstein, uh, Tom Fitton, who is the head of Judicial Watch, but not a lawyer, and uh, Epstein, who is a lawyer, but um, has uh, never actually tried a case, if you ask the other uh, lawyers on Trump's legal team, and whom they all have 
vehemently disagreed with when it has come to Boris's legal strategy, he has ended up in uh, these predicaments and now is facing uh, indictments um, in two different cases and uh, these most recent federal charges. Um, but in our story, Christopher Keis, who was brought in to become this, to professionalize the operation, he was quickly sidelined after this uh, approach that he presented of trying to go to the DOJ with a more cooperative stance and resolving the, the situation was uh, rejected by by Trump. And that shouldn't really come as a surprise to those who have covered him for the last eight years. This is someone who has uh, con consistently doubled down um, in his—and continued to engage in illegal or potentially illegal activity, uh, issuing lots of different legal voices around him at, at all times, uh, really, no matter the topic that he's faced with, whether he's in the, the White House or now post-presidency. Um, but it does show that he potentially missed the boat. And if you're looking at the charges, uh, more broadly speaking, there is a, a very um, stark delineation of uh, the former president facing charges on all of the items that he refused to give back to the National Archives, but the ones that he did give back and, and did ultimately uh, initially comply with um, per his first lawyer, Alex Cannon, which was all the way back in last February of 2022, he was not charged with, with anything. Well, it's such an important point. Uh, Mary McCord is also along with us. She's a former top official in the Justice Department's National Security Division. Um, Mary, it's, it's, it's an important sort of small, understated point in the article, but it drives home the fact that if Trump should read it, he might see that the advice he got from lawyers kept him from being charged on the documents that he followed their advice about, the things that he gave back. Um, that, that's not what DOJ came for. They didn't come for things that were mishandled, which is a potential crime, initially not given back to NARA, which could have been a potential crime. They took the position, and this isn't technically accurate from a legal standpoint, but they seem to have taken all that, all that ends well is well, and you won't be charged. That may or may not be, be a sound criminal defense, but it worked. And the things that he was charged for were the things that we still don't know for sure are back in the possession of the federal government. What do you make of, of um, the Times and the Post's pr pretty amazing reporting of a story that's happened over and over again? I mean, Trump's sort of, you know, lawyer roulette happens every time Trump's under legal scrutiny. And here we go again. Yes. And, you know, I think that the approach that we've now read about that Chris Kais wanted to take, I mean, that's the approach I would have expected really of any competent attorney who was trying to do the best for his client. Uh, he just had a client who just does not want to listen to his attorney's advice when it's not consistent with whatever he personally feels is the right thing to do. And I think that's, you know, really coming back to, to harm him in this instance. And it's interesting because Mr. Trump keeps talking Talking about this is just about the Presidential Records Act, and under the Presidential Records Act, I had the authority to take all of these records. I have the I have the authority to decide what's mine, what's personal, and what's not. And there's two, a couple of problems. Long, uh, problems with that. One is he's just legally wrong. The Presidential Records Act explicitly by statute made clear that any documents or information that refer to official business of the president are not the president's personal records. Uh, they're not the former president's personal records. They are the records of the government. And it's the archives who will decide, is there anything in those boxes that is purely personal and we'll send it back? And so he relies on this. But the interesting thing, and to the point you just raised, Nicole, was even violations of, you know, federal records, like taking federal records that aren't classified can violate another provision of law. But the government wasn't interested in that. The government got involved in this to begin with because the National Archives said there's a whole bunch of stuff missing that is presidential records that we need for history, we need for the archives. And it's only once they realized that there was classified information in those boxes did they involve the Department of Justice. And this could have all ended very shortly thereafter if there had been cooperation. And we've said this over and over again, uh, you, me, Andrew, who's on, I know with you that 
know, this didn't have to go down this way. And, you know, I really, in some strange way, almost pity anybody who takes a chance to be Mr. Trump's lawyer, because it tends to not end well. And in fact, I don't know why anybody would do it anymore. And Mr. Kaiser is right in there again.